Thank you. It's super fun to be here. You know, I've heard a couple people say this is such an odd situation to be in as kind of a startup person because it feels very academic. And, and my little tag here says professor. But I'm less of a professor of professing ideas and more of a tasker. So you're going to be doing stuff today. And, uh, and so just be prepared for that. So and let's go ahead and get the handouts passed out. You can do it at any time. I work a lot on paper, even though I've been in digital product for the last 20 years. And, uh, and sometimes I get you know, beat up for it. People are like, oh, so many sticky notes. Oh my god, so many pieces of paper. Isn't that environmentally expensive? I'm like, you know what's really expensive? Failed companies. So I just you know, <laughs> go with the paper, get things working out on paper, and then we'll take some tech to it later on. All right, so as introduced, my name is Kate. I've been at a variety of places. Um, the podcast that I host is a UX-oriented podcast. Uh, it's not safe for work. Also, I'm probably not safe for work. So if I let go with a couple you know, expletives, uh, it's just kind of the way I roll. Um, but I'm curious, oh, and everything I say here is tweet friendly. There's nothing confidential. I'm not all that tweet friendly. Sometimes I'll tweet mean. But um, I encourage you to, to tweet out anything that you would like to. So y'all have had lunch, and I think you've been here for a couple days. So that doesn't always assume that you kind of know each other. So I'd like to spend our first two minutes building trust. Two minutes, no trust falls required. But just say hi and introduce yourselves. And I'll walk around. We're really going to take like two minutes for this. It's going to be super quick. But just say hello, introduce yourself. You know, we're all kind of working on hard work here. So, uh, so let's get to know the room. All right. So I'll start the, the timer. Because that is the way I roll. And turn around, say hello. Let's like get the room chatting a bit. Yeah. Now that we all know each other so closely and intimately and are old friends, uh, here's a few of the companies that I've been able to work with over the past you know, a few years of my, of my career. Um, many of them, let me go back one, many of them you might have never heard of because sadly that is kind of the, what we sign up for in the startup world. Some are pretty big, others are incubators or accelerators um, or investor firms similar to True, et cetera. And, uh, and throughout all of this, you know, the one thing we always say is our work is hard. And, and it is. But I've kind of built my career on what if it wasn't as hard? What if we just asked better questions or simpler questions and kind of came up with clean and simpler ways to um, to start to build our products because they're going to get complex anyway. How can we start simpler? And one of the ways that I've started doing that within my own practice is really with metrics. And so that's what we're going to talk about here today is UX specific metrics. Um, along the way, you'll be doing some other things that won't feel quite as numbery. Uh, and, uh, and so that's how we're going to roll. So here's a couple things of what to expect. So I'm not obviously an expert in your business. But the good news is you are. And my role here is to help you think about your company in a way that you can build your product that works for real humans and measure that so that you can actually make your product better over time. That's kind of the whole deal of what I've been talking about lately. Um, many workshops, if you've been in one, are like, take a half an hour and do this thing. And it's kind of fake, and you're working with an example product. But I want you to work with your own products, and I'll have some help on how you do that. We're going to be working super fast, so all the activities are two to five minutes. I assume you already know the information. You're just going to be answering questions that I prompt for you. So sometimes workshops you know, feel like this. Ours is going to feel more like this. <laughs> and, uh, and that just is kind of the way we roll. So this might not work for everybody, right? Like You might not like the pace. You might not like the prompts. You might not like the perspective. And that is totally OK. Permission not to buy right here. But all I ask is you just kind of put yourself in my hands for the next 90 minutes. And let's see how far we can get together. Okay. So how do we know our work is working? And this is the most terrifying question. It keeps UXers up at night. It keeps product people up at night. It certainly keeps founders up at night. And I've been that founder up at night. Um, and so I'm curious around here, like who here is from a design background or whose de design is your primary responsibility in your company? Go ahead and raise your hand. OK, a couple. What about technology or development? Engineering. OK, more so. What about like product in general? Like you're a product manager, you're a product um, owner, et cetera. And what about business, sales, marketing? They hate it when I put it all together, but I do it anyway. Yeah, right there in the middle, I'm like, I am business, sales, marketing. <laughs> Great, well, all of these things kind of roll up into this idea of what is our company doing and, and why. So the way that we can start to do that is by measuring our UX. 
Kivax is such a strange term because everybody wants it, but nobody really knows what it is. So I'm curious, are some ways that you all are measuring UX now? Is anyone measuring UX in their companies? Yeah. We roll it under kind of our general product KPIs of um, you know how many conversions and stuff like that. So the success metric of the UX should help that along, um, and then that is uh, melded with a qualitative like interview and stuff like that. Nice. So you actually meld qualitative with some of the quant related to conversion or funnel or some of those types of KPIs that are fairly, fairly you know concise around your product. Yep. Nice. Anybody else doing similar things? Yeah. A-B testing. A-B testing. OK, this one's better. That one's, you know. Net promoter scores. Net promoter scores. Yep. So would you recommend? Yes. We're doing um, so we introduce new roles, prototype. Nice. So you prototype, you test. Um, we never test our users. We test our prototypes with our users. And then, we, uh, and then you actually have some qualitative data as well. Nice. Anybody else? If we have a product that's impacting people's health behaviors and we know if they do certain things on our site that they'll be healthier at the end of it, so we measure those things because we know that if they're not doing those, they're not going to lose weight or do the things that they're trying to I love that. So you have health outcomes, and the interactions within your site are actually correlate or, or causation for those kinds of outcomes. Yeah, I love those goals like, I want to lose 10 pounds. It's like, you can't just decide to do that. You have to do these things that are trackable in a different way. That's an outcome metric. It's not a process or a progress metric. Nice. So that's a pretty common handful of things. Um, I've noticed that there's been, there's such expertise around data and metrics collection, especially in data instrumented products like probably what we all have. Uh, but there's not some way to correlate that to the human behavior. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about today. So as far as our questions, in order to get to what we measure, we have to know these three questions. We have to know what are we trying to accomplish. We have to know what that actually looks like in a fairly specific and, and um, vivid way. And then we also need to know how we measure and track that. So I think of those as like the roadmap on how we actually count things and calculate things. I talk a lot about the three languages, numbers, pictures, words, and how they all go together. So even though this is a numbers message, there's pictures and words that we need to help with that. So to get warmed up, we're just going to pick an idea for the day. You all are here with companies. I'm going to assume you pick something with your company. But you can pick either a product you're working on or an idea for a new product or feature if that's working for you. Everything I'm going to talk about today scales from like company to product to feature to interaction or customer problem. So if you have some product features, but you're actually working on really digging into another customer problem, you can pick that. Um, you're going to need pens and some paper. You've got your little handout with you. You can use that for notes if you want. We're going to take one minute and just write the, the topic that you <coughs> want to focus on today on a sticky note. And that way, when your brain gets crazy, you can like look at it and say, no, 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 no I'm focused on this. All right, so what you're going to do now is do a quick product snapshot. This is going to be familiar to you, but there's really a system in all of our products. There's people, the problems it solves, and then the thing. And any time I go to a conference or um, I'm amongst the people with startups, pretty much everybody comes up and says, hi, can you do a UX review of my thingy? Let me give you a demo. And I'm like, ooh, put that away. What problem do you solve for your customers? Because without that information, I can't give you any meaningful insight at all. There are no best practices, just practices for your company. So I'd like you to go ahead and, and use a template or a blank sheet of paper and just answer these three simple questions. Like, who are the people? Who are the users? And what problems do they have? Um, I'm going to use an example throughout our session together. It's Taskadoodle. It's kind of a mobile sharing um, application. And so for Taskadoodle, the people are working parents with kids. You know, it's kind of a common problem. Um, the problems that they have is they need to be able to share tasks while they're on the go. Uh, they're too busy. They need to get more things done. And they need to know when something's completed. And really, everything in that footprint of the product needs to go towards solving those problems. Anything else is just going to be a distraction. And so then the solution is a mobile app for sharing tasks. And really, this is the level of simplicity we want. That's why I've only got two minutes, because if, if you have a lot more time, you just add a lot more words. Turns out that's unhelpful. So we're going to take just a couple minutes and uh, go ahead and write down who is it, what are their problems, and what's the solution. If you're an enterprise app and you have a buyer and then a user, pick one of those. If you're a marketplace app and you have sellers and buyers, pick one of those. You only want to focus on one customer set for, this, for our time together. Okay. All right. 
It's only on a piece of paper. You can refine it if, or catch up or keep going if you want to. But I'm going to move us along because we only have our 90 minutes. I'm going to make sure we get through the full arc. So in our three questions, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, <clears> or <throat> three questions we need to answer. What are we trying to accomplish is the, the first most important one. Like, what is everything that we're trying to do? Otherwise, you just have no chance at all at trying to capture or track it. And I'd like to introduce with you um, a stack for what I call the UX stack. And being in the UX field for a good season period of time, uh, it's hard. People say, like, what is UX? What do you do? And it's, a, it's hard to kind of grasp, actually, what that purpose is. And so if you do, if you Google like what is UX and you look at images, you see all these fancy colored Venn diagrams, usually have a lot of overlap with a lot of fancy terms in them. I found those meaningful only if you already know what they're talking about and not really helpful for explaining what we do and why we do it. And as product people, we're doing all these things. So this is a whiteboardable, really simple sketch that you can use. And pretty much all of your activities as a business should be mappable onto this simple diagram. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce it to you. Then we'll use it as a framework for our time. So we have humans, users, people in the world. And these people have needs and goals and problems. Turns out we can learn those by observing them, watching them, talking with them, listening to them. And those needs and goals get translated into something you can think of as uses. And the phrase that really encapsulates uses is, what can someone do with our product that they can't do without it? Okay? It's a very simple phrase, surprisingly tricky to answer sometimes, but just a very simple phrase. From those uses, we distill out our features. And this is a feature prioritization diagram, kind of uh, two by two. And only from those users, uses should we get our features. And from those features, collections of features put together with a look and feel, an aesthetic, a brand, a voice, that actually creates this coherent um, product. Okay. So the key part about this diagram is through, well, actually, when we talk about UI, there's this little pieces. Like it, a lot of people talk about UX and UI together. I'm like, yeah, those aren't the same things. All the UX fiddly bits kind of live way down here. And so sketches and interface and pixels and mock-ups and all of that like lives way down here. And through uses runs this water line. And everything above this line is about people in the world. And everything below the line is about product as an answer to those people in the world. So if you're trying to make a great product, you can't just focus below the line or make something below the line and try and push it up through sales and you know, paid placements above, up above the line. It's got to be reflective. Now, this doesn't really have much about your company. And people start companies with a vision or a mission. And so your company lives kind of up along in this area. And where your company purpose and those needs and goals intersect is going to be your value proposition. So you need to really have that defined and understood before you should really invest anything in the much more heavy, intensive, and cost, um, costly efforts down below that line where you start building product. Now, we think in solutions. So um, it's not uncommon to talk to someone that says, I want to build a data analysis app or a data analytics platform. Well, that's all very well and good. And you can start here with the ideas for features, but you really owe it to yourself and the whole team and your investors to explore what those people are, who those people are, and what their needs are. Otherwise, you can put a lot of effort into buying, into making a product nobody wants. And you know, I've, I've been through that world. That is not a pretty world. It's an expensive and heart-wrenching world. So don't do that. So we can have these users and needs and goals to help shape and frame everything we do as far as our product. And that little diagram is with you. The key part that we're going to be focusing on is uses, because that's really the meat where you get to measure things that actually make a difference. Okay. So let's take a talk through a word version of what some of those uses are. And you know, I'm not a huge fan of like fill in the blank templates, but sometimes just as a guide point of how not to get too wordy, they can be helpful. So if you were going to define, use this entire stack to walk through, say, an existing product, something <coughs> like Facebook would look like this. So, Meet Erica, a socially engaged college student. Hopefully, there's some kind of validated persona to stand behind that. Uh, and her needs or goals are Erica needs to feel closely connected with friends near and far every day. That's probably feasible. With Facebook, Erica can share her latest thoughts and see what her many friends are up to. Again, nothing about the product yet. It's just about what the benefits for Erica, um, the problems and uses Erica will have. And then, using status updates, updates on her wall, messages, comments, and likes. So those are the features. But all those features are dependent on making sure that Erica's uses are met. And in a way that's universal, clean, consistent, and fast. 
So that's kind of the brand attributes of the company. So it's this really, this key uses, that's what needs to be defined pretty clearly. So I'll go through it again, this time with, um, task, with task a doodle. So you can kind of see what it looks like, but it's not quite so obvious. So with task a doodle, our user is Mary. She's a working professional, two kids. And she needs to share the load of having her tasks accomplished um, and get help completing those things. And with task a doodle, Mary can create tasks, share them with her spouse and kids, and know when something else gets done. It sounds so basic, but you know, that's actually kind of an important thing for her to be able to get done. And the features are going to be using the task scheduler, task sharer, and done notifications. And then in a way that's friendly, clear, visual, and fast. Right? So those are more on the marketing or the brand attribute side. But again, those key part, like what are we going to measure that helps us understand if our product is working, is going to be right in that middle line. So those key uses are something you want to really nail. And to, in order to kind of shortcut our way into that, so we don't have to go through the whole stack, you can just ask, what can our customer do with our product that they can't do without it? So let's go ahead and write one of those for yourself. And again, depending on where you are, you can use product, you can use feature, you can use interaction. Sometimes you really have to work in a very small scale for this. And just answer the question. With this blank, the name of this thing, your persona name, if you don't have a fully validated persona, talk to me later. We can talk about those techniques. Um, what can she or he do? And so that goal statement. Those people are good. So now let's move to the next part. Like, what does that look like? And if there's any part out of your comfort zone in this session, it's probably going to be this. So, you know, shake it off and just relax. Go along with me. Uh, so you, when you ask, wh who are your users? What does it look like when they're actually um, in the moment of need or getting the moment of benefit from your product? And what are they thinking, feeling, and saying? And in order to really communicate this, words are not sufficient. So we're going to talk about pictures. So here's a couple examples of those key uses from a company called Food Spotting, which isn't with us any longer. It was a great startup um, incubated out of user experience design company, Adaptive Path. Alexa Andrzejewski was the, the founder. She took it. She got funding. She had a nice product. It was acquired by Open Table, and now she's kind of over in the product team at Facebook. Uh, but one of the things she did before putting any code or any interface around that is she wanted to understand how her idea connected with human uses. And so she would draw these little pictures with a little short phrase, that key use phrase, and show them to people, get their feedback, get their insights. And she iterated through about 36 of these little snapshots over time, trying to see where the energy was and what people responded to and why, what, it really, what really spoke to them. And she found that just talking about it was insufficient. That by showing people a picture, they had a much clearer idea of what she was trying to communicate. And if you'll notice, like these are super simple pictures. You know, these are not sophisticated. But they give you a little bit more of a sense of context. And they actually put the human in the center of that description instead of getting caught up with all the technology. So to do this, you can either grab a sheet of paper or an extra one. I'm going to walk you through a super simple sketching activity so that you can feel more confident drawing pictures of people, which um, is not really common in our businesses, but needs to be more common. All right, so be prepared. There you're going to see the information on the slides, but then I'll also draw it on the whiteboard as well. So let's start talking about rapidly visualizing people in context. So our first one is star people. Has anyone ever, do people sketch? Are there people around here that actually routinely sketch pictures of people? And how do you, what's one of the purposes that you use to do that? To just think. <laughs> to think, nice. Uh, um, my strategies and the kind of context people are in. Nice. Context, and what about you, Steven? Uh, entertain my daughter. To entertain your daughter. All good party trick, apparently, so always nice. Anyone else sketch? Yep. Nice. So visualize, um, document, and share all kind of, you know, bang up punches one. Anybody else? Sweet. All right. Well, let me show you a few things, quick tips about this. So if you're drawing star people, the first step is to draw a circle maybe around the size of a quarter. And then directly under that, draw a straight line about as wide as that, as that circle head. This is the only time it gets complicated. You're going to go down for a point and up for a point, and then down twice as far, that's what the arm is, for the leg, and up for a point. Now, once you've got about half the person, it's pretty easy to complete it. You just mirror that 
down and up, down and up. I'm never completely, you know, completely even, but that's okay. And anyone anywhere can look at that and recognize that as a human being. Now, this has a lot more merit than um, a stick figure because it's hard to draw proportionate stick figures. People aren't really built like that. It's awkward, and there's a huge amount of like juvenile associations with this that just don't seem to get the pickup. But if you draw a person like this, it starts looking like there's a there there. So that's why star people are so helpful. Now, once you kind of get the basic form, you can iterate on it. And I'll draw a few other examples. Let me go back. Hang on. I'll draw a few other examples. If you want to draw some that's sitting, you start out with the same basic form. Draw them on the side. Give them something to sit on, like an L-shaped chair. Maybe a computer to work at. And pretty much anyone knows that's someone working in some kind of computing environment, right? You can do other handy things. It always starts with that circle and the line, and then a point and a little bit of a jiggle. Trust me, none of this has to be super accurate. And then the same formula. And this is someone pointing at something. If you want to give them a direction, give them a hat to wear. You can get a little bit fancier with some squirrely lines and a foot. Now you have someone waiting for a bus. It's really kind of a very flexible form. So start observing people and start looking and thinking about how your customers could be visualized with what they're doing. Honestly, this and this work most of the time. People say, how do you draw a person sitting down flush on, like from the front? I'm like, well, I don't because I just, I'm trying to get the point across. I'm not trying to draw a portrait. The other thing that you want is you want to be able to capture some, some, some sense of expression. And expressions and emotion, again, are a little hard. They can feel awkward in a business setting. But if your customers aren't having an emotion related to your product, like, what's the point? Like, who cares? We are humans. We have emotions. And for that, I use this shortcut called the expressions matrix. So go ahead and draw nine circles with little dots in the middle. They should look like buttons. I'll do it down here. Once you're done with that, all of the expressions have two, come from two places. They come from our mouths, they come from our eyebrows. So we can use this as a system to kind of crack into the basic human expressions that we have. So the first one, we're going to do adding a mouth. And on that first column on the left, go ahead and add a smile to each of these three folk. Can you see around? I know you're kind of in the middle. In the middle one, go ahead and add a meh, straight line. And on the far right, you know where this is going, you're all smart people add a frown line. So now you have three people that are happy, three that are like, meh, and three that are unhappy. The second place emotional intensity comes from is your eyebrows. So now, on the rows across, we're going to leave the top one as is. In the middle one, we're going to give everybody our up brows. Oops. And on the bottom one, we're going to give everybody down brows. And now you have a range of nine discrete, specific emotions that you can use. This comes in incredibly handy in usability testing because this, the person was confused is what your words might say, but this is not the same as this, right? This is a much more important problem to solve than this one. So when you're talking about like the level of your problem or how much joy your customers experience at that moment of release when you, you solve their problem, like, are they going from this to this, or are they going from this to this? Like you can use those faces and emotions to really communicate that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take your key use statement and draw a little picture of it. Okay? Something that you could share and say, this is kind of what I mean. Similar to um, the, the participant who was talking about having a documenting, kind of shareable way of showing the people. Okay? It is absolutely OK to be obvious. 
And this is a judgment-free zone, so if you can show your, your work to someone else, just don't laugh at each other's work, because that's a shitty way to be in the world. All right, so take five minutes, and then we will keep going. And pair up with someone and share your work back and forth. They should be able to kind of get a sense of what your company does from the picture and the, and the phrase. <laughs> All right, at least you got to see a taste. It's amazing how when you see someone else's work, it just, you know, broadens your worldview. All right, let's move on. So now you have, on this stack, you have this phrase and you have this picture, so you've got your key use. So now you're ready to start to measure something. If you don't have this, everything else is premature. Was anyone else in Amanda Richardson's data talk this morning? Did anyone go to that one? You know how she talked about, about the basic mechanics of, of data? She did an excellent job, but a lot of it was like, what's your product trying to do? That was a core <coughs> source foundation before you can really invest in a lot of data sophistication. Well, you just did that, so yay. All right, so let's move on. So now, how will we track and measure progress to that, out, that outcome and that key use? Uh, Josh Bacardo is a fantastic writer, and he's a great UX and product thinker. And his phrase really resonated with me when I read it. It says, your metrics are going to be as unique as your business. But I don't think that's as common a philosophy as we have really in the product world. Because generally what I hear when I ask what people measure are things like this. Over 10,000 downloads. Average time on site is 22 minutes. Or 450 more sign-ins this week. And I'll admit, I've said things like this. Have any of you said or heard anything remotely like this? How many downloads? How many new adoptions? Yeah. Well, What's unfortunate about that is that these aren't really helpful because they don't measure the usage of your product by your person. Okay? They're just other things that kind of go around that. And so for when we talk about understanding human behavior and human usage, there's a handy two by two that I always go back to about where metrics live in the overall broadness of understanding human behavior for our products. And it basically looks like this. This might not be new to you. It's a fairly common way of communicating user understanding but I like it, still works. So you have generative concepts, you have tools that help you come up with new ideas, and then you have evaluative types of techniques and tools, things that help you assess or figure out the merit of something. Okay? And then we also have quantitative analysis, things that speak the language of numbers, and qualitative, which we referred to earlier on when you were talking about how you currently measure things, things that speak the language of stories. Okay? And within those two ca sets of categories, those axes, we can plot pretty much all of the user understanding methods that we have. So common in the UX field, we have interviews, we have observational research, we have field research, where we actually go out in context and see what people are doing, understand deeply the problems they have and how they're currently trying to solve them. Right? It's fairly common. Then we also have usability testing. Usability testing, watching someone perform with your product or try and do something and then assessing and seeing how well your product is um, designed to actually help them accomplish that. And that's an evaluative method. And both of these qualitative methods are really the best source of unique specific metrics um, that you can probably find for your company. And Jared Spool, he's a UX thinker, kind of product guy, very well seasoned. He's been doing a lot of thinking about metrics and how they tap into actual product performance instead of some of the more business types of KPIs that are more common in our, in our companies today. So then over on the quantitative side, everybody wants to put surveys up here, right? Like put out a survey at scale, get statistical uh, relevance for various things, but ask people about stuff. And you know, surveys are tricky, not only because they're very tricky to write effectively, but also because once you've already proposed a question to someone, you've already shaped their answers. They tend to be more evaluative, right? It's kind of like, when did you last feed your dog? Um, yesterday, today, not at all. It's like, well, what if it was a week ago? Like, I, I ha I'm forced into answering these things. So surveys are tricky. Although I think there's an interesting opportunity with big data here, but nobody's really figured that out. So if you have a big data company, like, we should talk about this, because I think there's some promise of how we can be better generative through data patterns. But that leaves us evaluative and quantitative around metrics and analytics. And that's where we're going to be focusing our topic today. Okay? So anyone using two, three of these quadrants, a bunch of these quadrants? Okay. Has anyone seen this before? Like this is kind of old hat, you know what it's looking like? OK, good. So maybe this is new. Really handy when you're talking to your product team about the kinds of learning you need to do. 
to be able to plot your techniques on here so that you make sure you're using the right method for the right kind of outcome. So let's talk about metrics and analytics. These are all kinds of just only a little smidgen of the types of things that tend to emerge when we start the metrics and analytics conversation. And of all of these, yes, they're very important to our businesses, but all of them, really the usage stats are the ones that are related to whether or not our product is performing for our users. So we're going to kind of double down on that. And on those usage stats, there's some common, I call it the alphabet soup, there's some common metric kind of categories for this. Anyone using any of these? We talked about net promoter score before at the very early lifetime value, CAC, you've got your CPA, the ARPDAU, you know, all these things, right? So these are pretty common, whole field of growth marketing, et cetera, to try and make sure that these are performing and measurable for our companies. But that is a big toolkit, and it's not as helpful when you're specifically trying to figure out if your product works. So let's talk more only about the retention. Like, what are people doing within your product? And this is a handy diagram I like to use about retention because it kind of brings it home. How big do you want to grow your funnel? Well, it turns out growing it too early um, can actually have damaging effects on your company. So if you imagine your product, right, you get your little product, and everybody wants to put a funnel on it, hopefully not like as narrow as this one. Hopefully your funnel's pretty wide. You get a good conversion through it. And then you pour traffic, traffic into the top of that funnel. But if your product isn't working, people just fall all the way through. And so now you've burned through a lot of those resources because it can't retain the users that are really appropriate for you. So all of those retention metrics that we need to optimize first need to be focused on the product and they need to be in service to the users. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, I think Lean Analytics, has anyone read Lean Analytics at all as a book? It is your lucky day because this is a fucking fabulous book and it really talks about how you identify those behaviors and customer needs at various different stages of your startup as it scales through different maturity levels. So it's, it's you know, almost got a recipe book for that. Super fabulous. Alistair Kroll and um, Ben Yoskowitz have done a really nice job of kind of optimizing metrics within a startup, kind of a lean behavior type of way. And their, one of their philosophies is that the good metric is the kind of metric that measures, measures the usage of your product by a person. And they have some attributes of what makes an effective metric. We're going to walk through these together. It should be clear and specific. It should be normalized. It should be comparative, actionable, and then also it can change your behavior. There's no purpose really in measuring anything unless you know what you and your company are going to do about it. Otherwise, it's just kind of data decoration. It's not really helpful data action. So let's walk through a couple of these. So clear and specific. This means you need to know what those specific rep um, interactions are that represent desired user behaviors. Metrics are basically user behaviors, and it's the interactions that start to put those two together. And you want in your product to support the specific interactions that actually link directly to those key user behaviors that you're trying to increase. And you need to find the numbers that you would then use to track those interactions. Right? So in something like Taskadoodle, it's a mobile task app, there's going to be um, the ability to share a task, and I want to be able to instrument or sketch out where within that UI the chain of interactions or this chain of events are that represent that sharing a task has happened. And that gets very detailed very fast, which is why you kind of want to focus on a really meaningful metric at the, at the start of the process. Something like normalized is a rate or a ratio which means whether you have peaks and valleys in your users, uh, you want to make sure that it balances out so that you know if your product performance is getting better. And the best example for this is from a startup I worked with at Luxor, which is they had a certain number of total users, and then of those, they actually shared a task. Okay? So there were 420. So that's about a 53.7% yield. Not bad. Certainly could be increased. But then they were featured on the App Store, and so the product manager came in, they're like, oh my god, we tripled the number of people that shared a task. And we're like, woo, that's a win. Except it wasn't a win because our user base was so much bigger that it actually dropped dramatically. So you don't know if these numbers are good unless they're balanced out related to a proportion of your user base. Okay. So you've got to constantly more normalize them. And the next is comparable, so time stamped. You want to capture it at regular intervals. And for this, I love this because the case example is well, we have a big dashboard up. We know where our metrics are at any point in time. Like, we just see them. It's like, that's great, but that's not this purpose. Because what you want to be able to do is compare what it was before 
you change your product in some way and what it was after so you can correlate product changes to changes in those numbers. Okay? So in order to do that, you need them directly comparable over a span of time. And in this example, it might look something like this. You have on one week, you have the certain percentage of a, of a metric conversion. And then as you timestamp that week to week to week, it will highlight things like, well, what, what happened here? Clearly, this number is out of sync with the other numbers. Something happened. How do we correlate that difference? If you just watch it all the time, you never really kind of get these comparable timestamps. And then actionable, not vanity. Now, this is a set of metrics that are very common. And in the startup world, we have to feel good about our work. So we use them. They're also influential for media. They're good for team morale. They're great for investors, sometimes required by investors. But because they don't change your, your actual behavior, they kind of make you feel like this. So they're meaningful for one reason, but don't expect that they'll make your product better, because they're not about that. They're about something different. We need a way to actually make our products better. So actionable, not vanity. And the best quote from the Lean Analytics is, don't just ask questions. Ask questions to where the answers are going to change your behavior. Right? So a good metric has various characteristics. And this is the super simple, like, cheaped out version of it. It's as clean and as simple as I can get it. And it's been working. And it's to look through a continuum of what kind of metrics, how metrics go from kind of crappy metrics to great metrics, and what attributes actually make that happen. So something unhelpful in metrics is like signups. I guess a category not even something incisive you can start to measure. Something that would be a vanity metric might be the total number of registered users. Okay? It's only ever going to go up. It's only going to ever get added to. So that's more of a vanity metric. Something that starts to sound like good would be comparative and maybe have a timestamp. So like percent of new users per week, starting to be more measurable. Something that would be better would be something, if your product is a habitualized usage type of product, something like the percent of users who sign in three or more times um, a day per week. Like That starts to get at really frequency of behavior. But so far, all of these could be true for a whole bunch of different products. So the one that starts to be awesome is something like the percent of users who share a task three or more times a day measured weekly. Now, you might need to count up a bunch of numbers and do the calculations to be able to get at that one specific number, um, which is hard. And so that this is the type of behavior that if they're not sharing a task, they're not getting benefit out of a task -a doodle So we have to tie our metrics to the actual behavior that we want. Once you have a history of measuring these, you can start to look at things that are more leading, not lagging. And this is a nice category as well. And again, it's going to take some sophistication and some time um, in, the, in measurement to be able to track it. But there are certain things where if a customer has some kind of behavior, it just correlates more effectively, hopefully even causation. But I'll have another conversation about that later. Um, correlates to ongoing usage of your product. So in Nike Plus, probably none of you remember that, but it used to be a little thing you put on your shoe, and it would kind of sync with your iPod but way before um, iPhone days. And it was indicated that by the third run, a user of Nike Plus would stay a runner and a stay a user of that product. So then a lot of the design effort could go specifically shaped to how do we get people to that third run? Because once that happens, the product kind of takes over from there. And that is a powerful thing if you can do that. And there's some other examples. Zynga has, you know, if you come back frequently within a day of buying a game, you know, Facebook has this mythical, you know, plus the 10 days of, and friends. Um, I, I love the Dropbox, like one file in one folder. I'm like, well, it's kind of a basic. You can't really get any value out of Dropbox without at least that. So. But your product is going to have this hidden in there. And if you don't already know it, this is a technique you can use to start to get at that. So how do we get our awesome metric? Well, let's take a look at the checklist. A good metric measures the behavior, the usage of your product by a person. And a great metric, when you see it, says, oh my god, if we don't measure this, then..." We don't know anything, like, but you won't really be able to get there until you actually do some practice making metrics. So we're going to do that right now. And you're going to brainstorm in three minutes. You probably need less because you've been working pretty fast. So just take a couple minutes and brainstorm five ideas for metrics that you could count that directly would attribute to that key use that you sketched out earlier. Okay. There don't have to be great metrics yet. We'll get there. But just go ahead and what are some things you could count that would indicate that key use is happening? Okay. Can you go back and do this with your teams? I like to do it on sticky notes so you can put them all up and kind of pick the best ones from there. But for now, pick one 
that you want to focus on, and we'll make it, we'll improve it together. So your first step of improving it and making it awesome is check, does it begin with a number, preferably a balanced number like average or percent of? If it doesn't, then you'll want to change that. It needs to have some kind of numerical quantity to it. So it should start out in the phrasing with number of, or preferably average number of, or percent of. The second way is, is there a time basis? This is surprisingly easy to forget. But how frequently are you going to measure that, that snapshot of time? And depending on your product, it might be monthly. It might be weekly. It might be daily. But that's really going to depend on the kind of usage that you have. Usually, weekly is a pretty good place to start. Um, I work with a company that is seasonal. So they actually only reg reg um, measure a lot of things annually. It makes it very hard for them to experiment. So they have to kind of figure out ways to hack into that. But it's kind of a seasonal thing. So, the tor shorter timestamps can be good. When you get down to hourly, it's actually unhelpful because you're probably not releasing product hourly in that same way, even if you're continuous deployment. So weekly is good. And then lastly, there's this other element you can use, which is an object basis. So in many of our products, there's some kind of object concept, like a file or a thread or an email. There's this interactive piece that you can use to, um, to associate image, um, metrics with it. So the average number of messages per thread, or the average number of um, comments per file would be those kinds of things. So you can kind of chain these up so that you can be very specific and very incisive about the types of behavior that you're measuring. That's going to be depend on your product, but I want you to know it's out there as a possibility. So go ahead and take a couple minutes and make sure that that metric that you, that you shaped out um, has these important elements to it, at least number one and number two, and that it's specific to that key use. And then you'll get some help from your peers. And if you already hit it, like nailed it the first time out, you can just gloat quietly for a couple minutes. Just be proud of yourself. It's kind of amazing how long two minutes feels. Why don't we go ahead and move on and pair up with someone. If you're here with someone else from your company, go ahead and pair up. Take a look at it. And they should be able to look at your key use, the sketch of the phrase, and at this metric, and have that feel like a coherent whole. So go ahead and take just a couple minutes, share back and forth, um, and see if you can offer any advice to make those metrics stronger, more trackable, more incisive, better. Okay? And raise your hand if you have any questions, and I'll hop over. <laughs> Who's got a metric that they want to share as an example? Awesomeness. Yes? Right. Um, so percent of users per week that create two plus posts during the first seven days. For seven days. So is it the, the, so the two plus posts for the first seven days is their actual user behavior? Right. So how frequently are you going to count it? Uh, usually on a weekly basis, like a rolling weekly basis. Cool, per week. And what, is that, what would that help you do? If that number were to go up, what would you do? Uh, well, I guess to back up, the reason I'm measuring that is to figure out like, whether the users are uh, satisfied with their website. Figuring that like more engagement, more posts mm -hmm. equals like they're more satisfied with the, the way it looks and stuff like that. The way it's set up. Um, so that would point that our NUX like flows and stuff like that are, are working. Helping the site set up faster and stuff like that. So you're creating more posts. You're creating more posts. Desired data. Nice. Interesting. And then if you're not getting that, you can kind of do some things like usability testing, or you can do an A-B test for various different things and kind of optimize where that goes. Interesting. Who else? Who else has got one? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, so I do a, a wallet, do a wallet, a wallet. So the number of passes open is per user per week. One of our customers is, uh, right? So how often is that will? Nice. Nice. Especially like that those scans are then related to some your actual customers. So you've got users that are using it, but your customers, assuming AMC is the enterprise that pays you, right, yeah. for this kind of sponsorship thing. So if you can do that, you can correlate that to potential revenue or some that business. I'm not sure what your payment model is, but as close as they can get to revenue, that's always better, right? Yeah. Uh, so. Our end goal is getting people to lose weight. And uh, we know if they track what they eat, they're much more likely to be successful. So 
the metric I put was just the percent of people who in a week track their what they're eating three or more times. Okay. So and when you say track what they're eating, can you be a little more specific about like what does that look like in the so they, UI? They use the food journal. They write down everything that they're eating in the day. They count their backgrounds. It could mean several things. Okay. Is they the track is the food journal an actual interactive element of it, or are they doing that in some analog process and then They can do it. It's but they can do it through <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. You want them to. Tracking food is nasty and hard, and a lot of people have, a tr have struggles with adoption for those things. Yeah. We in, at Luxor, we had a, almost a completely analog process for some of the learning tools we had, and we needed to then design a way to instrument that kind of feedback. So we had people take a photo of something and send it to the product as part of their, like, digital holding spot, and that was the interaction that we had to instrument because we had no idea of what was happening in the physical world. Right? Like that's its own challenge. Interesting one. One more. Yeah. Um, the number of users editing our design system daily per client. Okay. The number of users editing your design system daily per client. And what company are you with? UX Pen, which is a kind of a platform a for design system design for Nice. So when you have that number, what happens if one of your um, design system clients like doubles their design team? How do you know that? I would follow up with like a question or user research or follow up with reaching out to them. What if they double their design team but only half of them are using it? Like how do you understand capacity of potential users? as a relationship of actual users. Because let's say more and more people, your design teams are growing, but fewer and fewer on that design team, you might not be able to have an indicator that you're losing a customer. So think about that. It's kind of a terrifying thought. But there was a, I was working with a, a company, and they were so good at their metrics that they actually had leading indicators of customer behavior that said within two months that enterprise customer would cancel. And so as soon as this behavior started, they'd call them. they are like, hey, you don't know this yet, but in a month, you're going to want to cancel our service. And so let's talk about how we can avoid that from happening and make sure you're getting the value. And of course, the customers were freaked out. They're like, well, that's weird, cool, but kind of creepy. But they, they appreciated that personal touch because there was this indicator that wasn't a positive indicator, but it was a potential risk for the business. And so you can really get in front of that. So think about how your customers' lives are growing, too, and how you can tap into that. So we're just going to do, so in the real world, when you're working analog, I know many of you have many sophisticated tools, but I swear to God, like a piece of paper up in your team space, really amazing. So you can do this as a team, and you can put it on this physical dashboard, hot, low fidelity, and it's sticky size, so you can do this over time. And you know, iterate through a few different ones to see which, one, which metrics you really want to start to optimize. Also, you'll see on this whole sheet that there's a goal and a timeline of when you want to reach it by, because these are just containers for numbers. In order to know what an appropriate goal would be, you have to benchmark it and measure it once and kind of see where you're at. And that might take some product adaptation and actually building in some techniques and tools within your UI so that you can even measure it. And trust me, that takes effort, it takes attention, and it takes precision. So that's why having the metric first can actually change your design behaviors. I got to tell you, I've been making UI for a while. And uh, the one piece that's changed how I actually construct interface is knowing what customer behaviors we're trying to instrument and design for. Because it's amazing. If you can't capture it, then you can't measure it. So as UX, your practitioners, or your UX people, or your product people, really, it'll change how they design to be able to do this work. So then what? So you've got all this. And now we're talking about the instrumentation. Uh, depending on how mature your product is, you might already have a platform. You know, Google Analytics is fine, except out of the box. It does nothing but make you feel safe. It's filled with kind of vanity or what I call um, health metrics for uptime and that type of thing. To really get at something like goals or conversions, you need to be very specific with how you instrument and connect up Google Analytics. So having this set of, of, of precise metric will be key for doing that. But there's other ways that you, can t that you can gather this information. You can do it technical by hand. You can call people and ask them what they're doing if you're at a really early stage. You can do data dumps into various just different flat files and then see if you can start to assess and analyze those in everybody's favorite tool, Excel. Um, 
or you can instrument it with some of the, the event tracking software and platform tools that are, that are available. So there's a variety of ways to do it. It can get expensive fast. It gets confusing fast. So start specifically with what is the behavior we're trying to, to increase, and then measure that. Now, when your folks are making UI sketches, and hopefully they are sketching, because I still believe like wireframes hopefully should be dead. I know it's like they're going to kick me out of the UX club. But uh, I think wireframes are often a distraction from the kinds of techniques we do. I'd rather go from sketch to code and prototype. And I just think that's a faster way to work. So if your designers aren't coding, they should probably continue to learn to do that. Um, but being able to do a sketch specifically so that you can instrument and figure out where you're going to count these things, and then talking to whoever is responsible for your, doing your data capture. It might be your engineers, it might be you, it might be your product people, it might be a data team. It doesn't matter. You need to be able to figure out where are these events and what kind of snapshot. It doesn't need to be time snapped as well as the actual event value. There's a variety of sophistication with that. So write out the whole list of like what happens in the UI that indicates that that customer behavior is happening. And it's very rarely like the easy button you know, that somebody hits once and you count it and you're done. Plus, because you're going to time snap this, you have to figure out what your cadence of time is. So is it 24-hour time? Is it weekly time? What do you do? Is it monthly? Or is it every 30 days was one? Well, over 30 days, that's going to shift your deadline throughout the year, because not every month has 30 days. Do you have people in global time zones? How do you know where they are? How do you normalize this? These are sophisticated hairball problems, and they'll come at you. So at least knowing why you're trying to do this is super important. And then how do you track progress? That's all about setting the goal, getting a benchmark, even if you're wildly off at some place to start, and then how you can start to track from there. Now, when you track over time, whether you use a sophisticated tool or something as simple as just a list, <clears throat> you will have these data values. But what's really handy is to put them into some kind of visual story. right? So it could be a chart, it could be a bar chart. But I like the line chart and like the, the mountain graph and being able to annotate what the numbers were doing and then what your product changes were, that's the story you really want to capture. Right? So you're going to release product. And then from that release, you might have a change in the metrics. And that's the muscle you're trying to build as a team. So when you get to something like being able to annotate, we changed the label of an interaction from one thing back to something else, and you see a lift, then you can correlate that product change to that actual metric change. And that's why you want to start small and very specific, because if your team can move a metric intentionally, I can guarantee that is an ad is like a superpower. That is a superpower skill. And you want to be able to do that routinely over time, because there's no one metric that's going to last forever. It's going to shift as your product goes through its different maturing, and as your customers change over time as well. So how do we know our work is working? Well, we've answered these three questions. What are we trying to accomplish? What does that look like? And then how do we measure it and track progress? And you've got the map. And what you did is you made at least a word statement of it, and then a picture so that anyone can kind of step into the shoes of what that key use is. And now you've got that kind of key metric as a blueprint for what you need to measure in a sophisticated way with your product. So with all that together, it means that you can start to correlate the user behavior and the product releases that you do. And since those are the two edges of the stack, there's a lot of in between, in between those. And so being able to have a true and authentic and correlated story between those, like that is product gold. And that is what I would hope for you, so that we can all go out and make our products um, awesome so that our customers will have their dreams come true. So that is our time today. Here's some really good books that you can geek out on. Measuring the user experience goes through a lot more um, I'm not sure it hits at metrics in the way usage is that we covered today. Lean Analytics and UX for Lean Startups are both excellent books. And, uh, and the deck will be available. So um, I want to thank you for your time and for working on things today. And please go out and metric. And I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Do we have a few minutes for questions? Are we? OK. So I'm going to leave that slide up because it's so deeply disturbing, right? <laughs> it's just, I like kind of just standing in front of it being like, awesome. All right, so that's it. What questions do y'all have? So the question is, is we get paid for signups. So it's OK to monetize that. That is definitely something you want to track. Um, do you get, is it then a monthly type of thing? Once they've paid you once, whoever's paying you? Different milestones. OK, so different milestones. Sign up being one of them. And it's an area we're trying to work on right now to get 
more people. Got it. So we have to measure it. Um, but I don't know, it's making me think like, and we measure many other things. So that it brings up a really terrific thing. You know, I was having a debate with Laura Klein. She and I fight a lot um, in our podcast about user stories and which ones are good, et cetera. And you know, the classic, like, a user wants to log in. But that is such bullshit. No user wants to log in, right? Like, that is not something I think I can log in today. No, a user wants to protect their shit from other people looking at it. Like, that is the use underneath that. So no user wants to sign up. Right. I'm sorry, but they don't. But they're going to sign up so they can do something else. And that's what you'll want to measure from your product perspective. From the business metric, of course, you'll want to measure anything that directly correlates with getting paid. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's called What is Wrong with UX? And uh, it's not safe for work, but that's OK. Uh, there's about, I can't believe there's like 50 episodes out there. It's too old ladies drinking and kind of swearing about product design. So, <laughs> what else? Yeah. Wireframing. Wireframing is dead. Um, <laughs> it's not really dead, it's just kind of limping. Uh, <clears throat> and the UX pen folks hopefully will have a better platform addressed to this. So as far as wireframing, it's a, it's a thinking process of putting you know, boxes and arrows within some screen so that you can kind of understand how those interactions work. But what I found is that because most wireframe tools are very static, I mean, God, God forgive give you if you work in Illustrator even, but um, even things like Sketch, like they're static. And there we go. Um, so they're static, and right now, without understanding the interaction feel and the play out of something, it's very hard to design an effective set. It's kind of like trying to make a movie out of just individual stills. But what you do when you make a movie is you make a storyboard so that then the actual cinema can fill in a lot of those gaps. But you make decisions about a movie with a storyboard, right? And so I think that this idea of storyboarding or interaction sketches are just faster and that when you try and put together wireframes, our tools are not nearly as flexible. I think probably things like prototyping, wireframey stuff, like, um, gosh, for some of them other than UX Pen, that's what I've been using more of, but like Flint.io or um, any of the mock-up kind of things, those are fine because they actually help you walk through that. But I come from the days where you were doing Redline kind of very specific high fidelity mock-ups of every potential page state iteration. And that's just, it's just a waste of time if you're building that for spec. So um, I think the team approach for Agile, where you're using more of coming up with ideas and then rapidly iterating through code development to see how they behave within a design system for the aesthetics and the brand, I think that's a much more healthy system for the types of products we need to build. That's where I go. Anyone love wireframes? You're like gonna you know, stand up and like, you know, protect wireframes from big bad Kate who hates them. I actually like it because I do both. I sketch it out on you know sketch and then I I I'll like take it and it's just as fast for me to like you know, communicate to like remote teams. You know. Nice. When you um, deliver your wireframes and then you see what results like on the actual building code, is there ever any change between those two? There is. So mine actually goes straight to the former team to just go straight to the front end developer. So then we work together very closely. So it was super fast that way. Yes. Um, I guess for teams where that's not that interaction between the product person and the front end developer is quite there, I guess it wouldn't be as useful. But mm. it's a great communication for the community. Hey, like, here, look who this. This is what I want. And then he'll say, Actually, that's if that's not possible. Why don't we do this? That's yeah. the key, right? So let's let's. So it's a it's a good approxim not approximation. I'm sure there's a lot of thoughtful thinking in that. But what can happen is because the nature of those tools for wireframing are so different from the technologies we're using, they kind of need to change a little bit anyway. And sometimes there's better ways to solve that solution based on the capabilities of the code base that you don't have access to in the same way for a wireframe. So I think that that's why I'm kind of moving away from wireframe land. But I feel like absent the wireframe, you wouldn't, it would have been too abstract for him to understand what I was getting at. Because mm -hmm. um, I can show interactions, and he'll say, well, there's this JavaScript, and there's this JavaScript. Otherwise, it's like, 
static. I don't really get what you're trying to do. Nice. Anything that reduces questions, especially when you're moving something into code, is key. So if it's working for you, great. But if you have that thunk value of like, well, hello, here's my 50-page PDF deck of all of the possible interactions, and you expect code and interface to come out that looks like that, then without any communication, well, you know, welcome to the waterfall world of enterprise is kind of what I would say on that. What else? Yeah. Are you cursed? Am I cursed? The power went out. Did but it, to no. Well, maybe. Did you say You've been listening in. Yes, there was a big fire at this conference I was at last week. It was Enterprise UX. Speaking of enterprise, I think it's enterprise. See, I said enterprise, and the power went out. So welcome to the startup world. Maybe I am cursed. I don't know. I'm not going to claim it. But, but most of the power came back on, so that's good. Yeah. Oh. OK, uh, do you have any uh, tips for finding those? Um, like valuable customer success metrics? Because you make it seem so easy, like, oh, Nike, like, they figured out that free runs is what you need. But it could be like whether they bought it themselves, or it was a gift, or the length of their run. So you just sort of cast a wide net um, and then mm. see which metric aligns with customer success. I think that's, that question's going to vary dramatically. Um, when we were working, let me tell you my personal story. I haven't seen every company. but. Um, when I've been working with teams, they start with a, like a customer behavior that they believe will, that indicates like adoption, and then you have to measure that actual customer cohort over a period of time. And when people leave, you kind of attribute that to whatever cohort and see if you can do any analysis or any understanding of that. I think that's really where qualitative methods come in, talking to people. Why are they staying? Why did they leave? What are they using? What's not satisfying them? And having an ongoing practice for, sometimes we call it usability testing, but for customer discovery, I think is key for that. I don't know that we'll ever really know. I mean, you've heard about the Evernote smile, which is a, a visualization of Evernote usage. I'm not sure if it still holds, but um, Phil Libin, discovered this, which is people would adopt Evernote, and they'd put a bunch of stuff in there, and then they'd stop using it. And then they'd forget everything that they had put in there, which is the whole point of Evernote. You don't forget it. And then they'd be like, oh, wait, it's in Evernote. And then they'd start using it again. But it didn't really have the value for recent stuff, because people weren't wanting to look that up again. Right? And so there was this kind of strange, they call it the Evernote smile. You can Google it. That's weird. And once they figured that out, they, they could stop the battle of trying to make sure that their hockey stick always went up. They're like, it's just going to be a flattening. But then if it didn't pick up again on cohorts, then they could start to do more analysis. But every shape for those products is going to be different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, getting these metrics together just takes a lot of time and effort. To like, to that. Like, so how do you prioritize? Kind of, you know, as you create these, these metrics that are a little bit better indicators of like spending the time to like implement them, um, especially if you don't have baseline numbers for that yet, or it's like, oh, these are better indicators than what we had before. Um, how do you actually like rank those and you know throwing them into a sprint to like implement like pulling the data or something like that? That's a good question. The uh, I think start with basic and what's fairly as long as it correlates to a user behavior that's going to be directly related to what your product is designed to do, um, I think start as simple as you can. And maybe it is something, as Katie had mentioned, in signups, because that's the first step of that next thing. But then you need to figure out, like, what is that, what is that one thing that somebody needs to do the first time? And in something like social media, maybe it's making that first post or something. Try and get people to that stage. I've noticed that metrics do generally sequence out over a lifespan of customer behavior. So once you start with one and it feels like it's, it's starting to move and you understand how to measure it, then you can do move to something more sophisticated. But I'd say start simple. Even simple is going to be more detailed than you thought. Um, but starting simple and having it be about what the product is designed and purposeful to do, that's your first step. And you know, products don't just have one thing they do. But uh, you've got to try and figure out the one thing that your customer really wants to do. Otherwise, you probably. There's a risk you have feature bloat anyway. 
You know, we start with features, we think they're great ideas, we release them, we never measure whether or not people use them, and then we release the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and now our customers are confused, they don't care because they didn't want that crap anyway. Or you have three features that kind of all try and re realign with the customer behavior, and you didn't know that because you didn't realize you were trying to move customer behavior. You were just shipping features. I know it's a common situation, it's really kind of tricky. What else? Anything else? Let's end on a high note. Like, what's a good thing? Someone tell us a, a story of data or customer measurement success. Anyone got one of those? No one's smiling. Yes. Not mine, but my looked at our data and um, found um, what we now call the customer success stages. So stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And you you want to get everybody to stage five by the end of the trial. And like once we had those aligned and knew what each thing, what each bucket was, <coughs> we could say, hey, this month we've had this many people and we started, we were able to notice problems in the trial UX or we were pointing people to the wrong activity. We, it's been a very helpful metric for our company, um, and it also, you get through all skip five stages, you're very likely to convert. So it also helps our sales team. You can just look at what stage they're at and be able to take that metric. Nice. Identify readiness. There was, a, there was a restaurant in Marin somewhere. This is an old Harvard Business Review article, but it was one of the ones that it was a catalyst for even thinking about measurement of customer happiness or adoption or success. It was quite a few years ago. Um, but this restaurant had a team approach to the tables. It's kind of high end. And every time a server came by, they would they would kind of assess what was going on at that at that table and then they would go back to the host station and like put a number on it. And their goal was to get every table to a five. It was like one was kind of a, they were having an okay, you know, kind of crappy experience. And five was as everybody seemed really awesome. And so they would do things if they went back and looked and there was like at a two or at a one or something dropped them back, they'd make changes. So anniversary, you know, dinner, and they use this example, anniversary dinner, and the very attractive server is getting maybe a little bit too much attention from the husband, swap out the server, right? So you think about that, but it was directly changing their behavior. And they had this one story uh, where this woman was dining alone and they just could not get her to a five. Like she was quiet and res reticent, not really very interaction, interacting, and she was just sad. And so they're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? So after the meal, instead of bringing her her dessert, they invited her into the kitchen and sat her down and the chef was there and they got to talking and she was kind of just part of the kitchen and it was later in the evening and so the chef asked, he's like, why are you here today? And she was there for their anniversary and she'd lost her husband the previous year. So this was an emotional threshold that she was dealing with, with deep, deep sadness. And being in the kitchen and being able to talk to someone about that, and being asked about that in that kind of very special private way, got her to a five. But really, ultimately, it's not the five that matters. It's that human experience and the care that we take for each other to get there. So kind of similar to your stages as well. All right, and that is our time. Thank you so much. You have just been marvelous, and the deck's available. Thanks. <laughs>